from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. All right, well, thank you everyone for coming today. Uh, my name is Jennifer Harpster. I'm a reference and research specialist for the Science, Technology, and Business Division here at the Library of Congress. I'd like to welcome you to today's program, Finding the Slippery Slope, Detecting Landslides from Space. This program is part of the 2015 series of lectures presented through a partnership with our division and NASA's Goddard Space Flight Center. And this is our ninth year that my division has been partnering, partnering with Goddard. Today's lecture features the research from one of NASA's Earth Science programs. These programs focus on the Earth's atmosphere, lithosphere, hydrosphere, cryosphere, and biosphere. With NASA's help, we can better understand our home planet and seek ways to improve prediction of climate, weather, and natural hazards. When we think of natural hazards, earthquakes, hurricanes, wildfires, floods, those often come to mind, but landslides are one of the most prevalent hazards that exist. NASA scientists study all of these, and today's speaker, Dr. Dahlia Kirschbaum, specializes in the remote sensing and modeling of landslides. Dr. Kirschbaum is a research scientist at Goddard's Hydraulic Science Department and is an application scientist on the team for the Global Precipitation Measurement Mission, or GPM. <laughs> GPM is a network of satellites hosted by a consortium of international space agencies. With improved measurements of precipitation globally, the GPM mission seeks to advance the understanding of Earth's water and energy cycle, improving forecasting of extreme events that cause natural hazards, and extend current capabilities in using accurate and timely information of precipitation to directly benefit society. Dr. Kirschbaum received her undergraduate degree in geosciences from Princeton and received a master's and PhD in earth and environmental sciences at Columbia. We are very happy that she has taken time out of her busy day to talk about uh, landslides with us today. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Dahlia Kirschbaum to the Library of Congress. Well, thank you very much for the introduction. Um, so, you know, it's August, everybody's kind of in summer mode. So hopefully this is both entertaining and informative. I promise you there will be a picture of a landslide. I promise you there will be video of landslides and people running for their lives. <laughs> I promise all of that will happen. Um, and I also, you know, I, there, you know, there'll be question and answer, but if there's something that isn't clear, please feel free to raise your hand. I, uh, you know, this is a small enough group. I'd love a dialogue if, if there's something that you'd like to ask while I'm speaking. Um, so I'm also going to ask a question. Does anybody know what landslide that is? Obviously, it's a landslide. Otherwise, it wouldn't be the front of my presentation. Anybody have a sense? This is a picture taken from the Landsat satellite. Um, and any idea where in the U.S. this landslide might be? Well, it says North Fork. Okay, yeah. I mean, I, I, I tried to make it, you know. <laughs> there you go. So Oso Washington landslide in, in upstate New York, in upstate um, Washington. And um, this was the worst disaster in terms of landslides that has hit our country in um, over a decade and a half in terms of landslide-related fatalities. Um, I'm not going to actually talk that much about this one. Happy to entertain questions. But what's interesting is that if you actually look, there are, let's see if I can have a little... There are landslide scars all over the place. And, um, and so the question is, you know, why do these events happen? How can we figure out how they're happening? Why does space fit into this, right? This is an event that usually is the size of, like, this room. And so what I'm going to try to talk about today is, is a, a basics, of, um, basics of landslides as well as give you some examples. And again, a video of landslides running people running for their lives so again this is from <laughs> so this is so this is a an aerial view of the landslide and um and so i'll be talking a bit more about that but first 
the question is, why do we care, right? What is relevant about landslides? They're a natural hazard, and they're also very important geomorphologically, which means that they help evolve mountain ranges. They help move sediment, and there's all different types of them, um, which I'll talk about a little later. But you can see there's rotational landslides and block slides and rock, sli rock falls. Um, and all of it generally I'm talking about, I'm going to talk refer to it as landslides, but I'm generally talking about all these different types. They are very, as, as uh, Jennifer introduced, they are pervasive. They happen in nearly every country. They happen in nearly every state in the U.S. And so I'm going to talk a bit about how and where they are, or where and when they are. But they also have a significant impact on people. So this is an example of debris flows that hit Brazil in 2011. Um, it, it actually caused almost 1,000 fatalities in the town's north, in the northern part outside of Rio. and. Um, and they've killed over 26,000 people in the last, since 2007. And that's an underestimate because that's only for rainfall triggered landslides. So this is both a pervasive hazard and it causes a lot of damage, both in terms of fatalities and economic damage. So why are we doing this from space? Well, to go back, we have four divisions at NASA. And um, what you're seeing the image here is actually NASA's Earth Science Fleet. And so all of these different satellites have different purposes and are all focused with their eyes on, or their instruments on Earth, to tell us about how our global Earth system is changing. And so with remote sensing, it allows us to not only look at one place at time, which is important, but to look over the globe. And so if we want to learn about landslides, for example, or rainfall in different places, having that network of information from satellites allows us to do that. Okay, so the rundown. This is what I'm going to talk about in this, in this uh, presentation. First, I'm going to give a brief overview of landslides to get everybody up to speed. What are they? How do they happen? There's videos. When and where do they occur? We'll look at some maps to see, you know, where are they happening? Um, I imagine that all of you have come from different places, at least you were born in different places, so you probably have um, different perspectives of, of what landslides mean to you. Um, and then I'm actually gonna go a bit into um, the Nepal earthquake. I'm, all of you have heard about the fact that the Nepal earthquake happened. We'll talk a bit about that, but we'll also talk about the landslides that happened from that earthquake, which was pretty tremendous. So I'm going to give you some examples of how we've observed those from space and what that really meant. And so I'll talk about NASA's uh, response as well as that of USGS and other agencies. Um, I'll go through some modeling activities and then talk about what you can do. So, you know, we'll end on a positive note. <laughs> okay, so landslides. Yeah, there are sound effects too. <laughs> Um, so landslide, as you can see, the, the large majority are rainfall triggered. And so essentially what's happening, as you see right here, there's a buildup of water along this what's called the failure plane. And so you have the driving forces, all the gravity and uh, material that's pushing down the slope. And then you have resisting forces like trees and grass and cohesion that are pulling things together to keep it on the slope. But the problem is, is when these driving forces overcome the resisting forces, then you have a landslide. So if we're going to look kind of at, in this little area, what we're talking about in the actual soil, um, think about a sandcastle, okay? So if, you have, if you're on a beach and you have all the different particles of sand and, and, you know, sand particles with shells and probably a cigarette butt somewhere, I don't know, depending on where you are. So it's pretty unconsolidated. You cannot pull it together. It's not, it's called unsaturated. It is not cohesive. But then, if you douse it with water, you can't, you have no, you know, it's all totally saturated. The grains just go every which way. But when you have suction, it means that the grains are starting to stick together. You have the exact right amount of water balance. And so you have, you know, this clumpy sand, which then allows you to build a sandcastle. And so that's kind of, that's my little one. I never put them in presentations, but I figured. <laughs> can't hurt. Um, so, um, so the point is, is that, you know, we need to have the right balance to keep things on the slope. And when there is a trigger, be it something that's shaking, um, or rain, for example, you have an earthquake, um, the soil or the rock is contracting because of its cold and then expanding. Um, you have human development, which is a huge issue, and even river cuts. So you have, if this is a landslide, you have the river kind of undercutting the toe of the landslide so it gets steeper and steeper. All of these are catalysts for landslides. All of these are triggers. 
So as I mentioned before, there's lots of different types. And I kind of like this figure because it has them all in one graph. But now, so you guys are all experts on how, nomenclature naming landslides. Since we're the Library of Congress, names matter. Um, NASA does too. Um, but if you uh, take the first part of the word, so rock or debris or mud, so that it describes the type of material. And then the latter part describes the type of movement. So for example, what you see here is on Interstate in, uh, 40 in Tennessee, there's a rock slide. Here you have um, a, a debris flow from uh, Hurricane Mitch in Nicaragua. So it's a debris flow. You get, the, you get the pattern. And then this is a land slide. But you have mud slides, snow avalanche. So now you guys are experts. That's how you name landslides. All right. OK, so where are they? Well, since 2007, um, myself, as well as the host of other people, including some people in this room, have been compiling a global database of rainfall-triggered landslides. Now, this doesn't exist anywhere else, so we actually have the only open database of landslides, period. So that's kind of exciting. Right now, we have over 7,700, so 7,700 landslides um, reported from all over the world. And so what you're seeing in this map is the landslide points, um, and then the size and the color of the dot are, are the number of fatalities associated with that. Now, this is only rainfall-triggered landslides. We're starting to branch out into other triggers, but rainfall is, is the, um, we started to look at that because of the modeling that we're doing with it. So you can just see kind of zoom in, and you see that there are these clear hotspot areas for landslide activity. The Himalayan arc, where the two plates are coinciding. We have lots of landslides. Um, you, can see, you can see all along the coast, or the western coast of, of um, South America, clearly. The Pacific Northwest, all the way down to California, we know. Um, the Philippines, Indonesia, all of these are really hot spots for landslide activity. Um, and, but I think the, it's important to note that all of these information, for the most part, are compiled from media reports. So we have man people going through Google searches, Google alerts, and manually documenting every single landslide in this database. It is extremely tedious, um, which is probably why nobody else has done it up till now. But it's also really important because without this type of information, we have information on earthquakes. We have information on hurricanes from satellites. We don't have a global catalog of these landslides. So to try to model what's happening or anticipate where these might happen, you have no way to validate or evaluate your models. So this is kind of our approach to trying to move in that direction. OK, what about the US? Well, this is what right now our, our inventory looks like. As you can see, there aren't too many landslides that have caused fatalities. Um, the Oso landslide up here is clearly the most uh, fatal landslide we've had since 2007, um, killing, I believe, around 50 people. Um, but there's, uh, so you can see the distribution and the number of reports by state. So California and Washington have about 36% of the total reports. And over 40, and not over, 44 states have reported landslides in, um, in their state. But this is just media reports. And so um, this effort, while it's been going on for several years now, we're working now to grow it to see how we can expand that database because you know, I'm working with the US Geological Survey and others, but there is no consistent US-wide database of landslides. So we are working on that. OK, where are they? Well, um, so if you look on the right-hand side, you can see the distribution of the number of landslide reports as percent of total um, on the top, and then the number of uh, percent of landslide fatalities. And so what jumps out at you is the US has 24% of the total population of landslides. Now, is that because the US is extremely landslide prone more than other countries? No. It's because we have English speaking, <laughs> English speaking media. And we've tried multilingual searches, and they are very difficult and time consuming. So we have biases in our database. And so the, one of the main goals is to try to figure out how it's biased and how we can improve that, getting other countries involved to really help us change the dynamics of where we're having landslide information. And you can see fatalities, China and India um, and Afghanistan have the most, the largest percentage of, of the actual um, fatalities. But another interesting statistic is if you look at the top 20 countries with landslides and you plot their GDP, so that's on the left, 
Um, what you can see, this is a log log plot, so it's kind of, yeah, otherwise it would kind of look like this. But what you actually see is that as the GDP increases, the total number of fatalities per event, or total number of fatalities by country actually decreases. So this is something that with more data we can get more into, but you know, this idea of how disasters impact different countries. Oftentimes, disasters um, impact more um, d advanced countries and in terms of economically, so it, it causes you know, loss of dollars, whereas in more developing countries, it tends to cause loss of life. And so we have shown this with other disasters, but for landslides, this is kind of a new field because we just don't, didn't have data. And so um, this is you know, preliminary work, it's published, but, um, but there's a lot more to do in that area to see what those relationships are, and most importantly, why? You know, what is really the reason? So when do they occur? I really just needed to use this pun. Rainfall in a landslide. So rain. <laughs> I just, I just wanted to. Okay. So um, you know, there. It's, it's really difficult. We don't have, as we've already talked about, a whole um, understanding of all the landslides. But we know from one study that about 98% of landslides are triggered by rainfall. Um, and so, you know, they. If you look, they. This is um, a graph on the top. They tend to peak in the northern hemisphere summer. So usually during all the Asian, the Asian monsoon and the hurricane seasons, um, and the fatalities, which is shown in the black line, peak at the same time. And below is our landslide database. And so what you see is the number of reports in the bars, and the black shows the number of fatalities. Now this is not, you know. You cannot draw a line through that and say, this is a good fit, right? So first of all, we need a lot more years of data. And the second is, is that there's some years that have more landslides than others, or that we found in the reports, and more fatalities. And so I actually did a study uh, on a paper that was published about the 2010 landslides, because I said, look, why do we have so many more fatalities and so many more landslides? Is it because there were two landslides that caused a lot of fatalities that's biasing the results? And the answer is yes. But then in terms of reports, we also had the highest number. And it turns out that everywhere that was a hotspot for landslides had more landslides than normal. And so the question is, you know, what are driving these global patterns of rainfall that might increase landslide activity? So what's interesting about 2010 is it started as an El Nino and went into a pretty strong La Nina. So a lot of places were affected by rainfall in different ways. So they were getting either more extreme rainfall or less rainfall or more extreme storms. And so by having this database and look at it over the globe over time, we're actually able to start to extrapolate okay, well, we're having an El Nino coming. Here are the areas where we have observed in the past that it's increased for landslide activity. So this is kind of see how you can starting, start to piece together these model components to be able to make a forecast of landslides. Okay, so now we're going into kind of the observations and impact. There's my Fleetwood Mac lyric. <laughs> um, okay, so the reason that I'm talking about this is um, you know, on April 25th, a magnitude 7.8 earthquake hit Nepal um, in the Gorkha region. And um, it caused over 8,800 fatalities. It injured almost 22,000 people. And then there was an aftershock, a 7.3 aftershock that killed another 135 people and injured more. And so this was a pretty tremendous earthquake, not abnormal for that area. And not, you know, unexpected because we knew that this area is very seismically active. But, you know, the when and how big, you, you just never know. And that's not my area of expertise. However, what's interesting is that after the earthquake, so, you know, a lot of people after the earthquake said, oh, my goodness, the buildings are going to fall down, right? Well, because I'm a landslide researcher, I said, oh, my gosh, there's going to be so many landslides. And then the monsoon is going to come, and there's going to be so many more landslides. So, for, so I think a lot of people have a vested interest in Nepal for a lot of reasons. We have some very close connections between NASA and um, a group in Nepal called the um, ISIMAD, the inter, uh, I have the, whatever it is later, but it's the science organization in Nepal. Um, and we have a lot of different relationships. In fact, I was actually supposed to go there in May to talk about landslides with a group of Nepalese and, and uh, Indian and all these different types of scientists, which, obviously did not happen, but we're doing it at the end of the month. Um, so the point is, is that after that, 
uh, earthquake, we were able to provide satellite imagery to figure out what was happening on the ground. And so it was things like, if you look at this image right here, and this is from an open file report from the USGS, you can see that this is the scar of the landslide and this is the river. So it, it, it went in and blocked the river. But right here where the arrow is, is actually a very small village. And so it happened about 500 meters below this village. But it also gives you a sense of what the topography of Nepal looks like. I mean, it is tremendous. And so what we did was um, NASA worked with other agencies to provide imagery and models and data analysis to give to the people both in Nepal, give to the State Department, give to the Office of Foreign Disaster Assistance to tell them you know, what areas might be higher priorities to task for satellite imagery or to go to on the ground because either people or the situation is precarious. And so the, um, they estimate, the USGS sent a team in a, couple, a month and a half later, they estimated there were over tens of thousands of landslides as a result of this. And so from this effort, we actually mapped over 4,000 of those landslides. It, it's a pretty tremendous effort. So just to kind of take a step back really quickly, um, in terms of remote sensing of landslides, so that means we have, you know, you're not on the ground, you're actually in space or airborne. And so there's a lot of different advantages. So you have airborne, you're flying in an airplane, you can see, you know, detailed landslide scars. This is an example from China. Um, this is another example from China. So commercial imagery can get very detailed into looking at, you know, the individual buildings. And then we also have some satellite imagery from NASA that, you know, has pretty high resolution. And this is from Indonesia. And you can, you can pick out these landslide scars. So what was really amazing about the landslide and the response, uh, the earthquake and the response in terms of landslides was that right after the earthquake, um, a group actually from cryosphere, so really focusing on the glacial regions, but they brought together about 50 volunteers from nine different nations to comb through in imagery from, you know, including Landsat and Aster and um, the Digital Globe and Worldview as a result of um, disaster charters, all with the goal of identifying landslides and providing that information to NGA, the National Geospatial Agency, USGS, and others. So they divided it into six regions based on kind of the, the, um, the major river networks. And so, um, so what I want to present um, here is just three examples of what we observed. And, um, and I need to give kudos to the people that really did this. I'm kind of just the mouthpiece right now because they spent a tremendous amount of time um, to, to really identify these areas. So first we'll look at an example in Langtang. Then we'll look at one um, a little further to the uh, west. And then lastly, we'll look at, um, at a landslide dam from Annapurna. So first, um, the Langtang Valley. OK, so Langtang um, was severely affected. It was actually the worst landslide triggered by this earthquake um, that we know of that affected people. It killed more than 200 people. So this is what looks like. This is from um, Landsat imagery. Um, so this is Langtang, and this is what it looks like before. Red means healthy vegetation. And then after the landslide, you can see the scar here. So this entire village was completely wiped out. And so by looking at this information, we could um, provide information to authorities with, to provide helicopter relief. And the analysis actually led to the complete evacuation and clo closure of this basin because it was just too risky and dangerous for those that were still alive after the earthquake. Okay, so just to give you a sense of just one landslide, or this is the, the landslide that caused the biggest area, um, uh, the most fatalities. So it originated right up here in, a, in this ice and rock debris setting. It then kind of took out this area right here. But what's interesting is because it's so, so steep, the material actually went airborne. So it actually kind of went like a slope and it just took off and it landed right on the village. And so because it landed like that, it caused a pressure wave that basically demolished all of the houses that weren't already covered by the landslide. So um, so if you look at this, this is really, this is a lot of relief or difference in elevation. So, you know, from the side, it started here, you can see all of this material, but then it's basically just a cliff face. Um, and so it, it basically went airborne. So all of these houses weren't actually impacted by the landslide, but were totally demolished because of the pressure wave from it. So that was a pretty tremendous landslide. Um, 
And then this is what it looks like from the ground, you know. So you see, you know, this is the village. It wasn't largely populated, but obviously enough. And then this is the after picture. I promise I'll end on a high note. Um, so the second example, um, one of the things, you know, this is a region where the steep topography and there's glaciers and there's rivers cutting through everything. So what, what, another thing that you get concerned about when you have this is, is landslides that trigger um, dams in the rivers. And so, you know, as I said, this is a natural erosion process, right? So you have the rivers that are used to cutting through this material. But if it's a lot of material, you worry about the river breaching really quickly and causing a flash flood. Um, and so this is what people were looking at. This is the Gap landslide in Manislu. And so this is before the earthquake. You can see kind of an old landslide scarp. And then this is after the earthquake. You can see the river. And then this is um, the digital globe, the high, com high resolution commercial imagery. And so what you can observe is this is what it was before, which is a little hard to tell, but you start to see the, um, the lake starting to grow behind it. But then you do see that there's starting to be a very, um, you know, white, white water rapids type river cutting through. And so the lake still exists, but they've determined that the system was efficient enough to move the water through without worrying about causing a flash flood. Can you give us an idea of the amount of time? Mm-hmm. The amount of time that it took for to cut through or the landslide itself? Well, both. So, yeah, well, I think it depends. Um, and so I'll, I'll give you this example. So um, this is the same type of idea. It was a landslide dam. From the ground, you can see this is the landslide and this is the width of the river. So landslides, these types of landslides pretty much happened quickly, very quickly. Um, and then you can see all of these different points are in this valley and this is the box that you're seeing here. So as you, so as a landslide happened, um, I guess the story behind this is that this landslide was identified by several of the people that were the volunteers. And they said, we need to look at the lower Pazang Lake. It's very important because we see through all of this imagery that the lake is starting to grow. So this is the lake, because from satellites, you can actually tell the surface area of a lake. So here on the 27th, when the first landslide hit, um, the lake started to grow, it kind of then leveled off, and then it started to grow again. And so this is in terms of the lake surface area in, um, in cubic meters, or in, um, in square meters, sorry. And so what happens is, and um, I didn't include that example, but I could show it to you later, is that um, it takes a while for the landslide to actually cut through. And it depends. It depends on a lot of different things. So the problem is when you see a landslide from space, and you see that it's blocking a river, the question is, is it completely blocking the river? What's getting by? So that's where, you know, boots on the ground, getting people there to see it is really important. But you don't have, I mean, there were kind of, a lot of people were busy there trying to, you know, aid in the evacuation. So what happened was we somehow, not we, but somebody on the team um, got in contact with a villager who walked 10 kilometers downstream to take a picture of this, to take this picture. And, or take that picture. And, um, and, uh, and so what, I mean, even though there wasn't a scale, you know, scientifically, you know, it gave us an important, important insight into how the landslide was changing. So the question is, is it still moving, right? So do we see trees that are starting, you know, to continue to, to fall down, just like we see here, you know, we have standing up trees and not standing up trees, right? So are things still moving? Is the river getting by? How much of the river is getting by? How is the lake level? Does it seem to be growing? So all of these questions you, you can sort of tell from satellites, but you need to have a, you know, a person on the ground sometimes to tell you about this. And so, you know, I can't give you an exact answer of how long it takes generally, but, um, but what we saw here is you can see that between April 4th and May 4th, April 27th and May 4th, the river grew pretty tremendously, and then it started to, to die off a bit. And then this is what happens when you have subsequent images. So it wasn't over right after the earthquake, right? Then we had, we had an aftershock, and then, you know, the, the, it just doesn't stop. So the point is, here's April 27th. You have a small landslide it's starting to dam. Then you have a new landslide, and a larger lake starts to form, and then things start to evolve here, and, um, and the lake still continues to grow. So, um, so one of the other things is, okay, well, if the, if the river is breached quickly, catastrophically, 
who, you know, what will happen? What's the flow look like? And so w one of these uh, groups did was, so this is the landslide from the side. It's like you're looking up the valley at the landslide. And then this is the town of Lower Pasang. It's about a population of about 300. So then the question is, so this is what kind of an aerial view from Google Earth yesterday. So this is uh, imagery from May 27th. Um, you can actually trace what the flow might be, model what the flow is to get to the population, how much time they have, how big of an extent. And so this is what it looks like um, in terms of how much volume will, tr will cause a, um, a flood. And so what basically this is showing is that you know, with a bigger volume of water, this is the extent of the town that's going to be inundated. Because you can look at an elevation model and figure out, you know, if this is flat and there's so much more water, then this is the amount of water that will cover the town. And so it's this type of modeling that, you know, I think people were starting to respond to in more um, quick terms so that we can actually get a sense of what this hazard is for the local populations. Okay, so um, in terms of the mapped landslides, as I said, we had 4,000 mapped. You can see this is a little confusing, but this is Nepal. This is where the epicenter was. That's Kathmandu. And there were a tremendous amount of landslides that were mapped as a result of this, all from satellite imagery. And so what I think was amazing in terms of the outcome was the international landslide community and the response all bringing everybody together. So, you know, I had calls weekly or every couple every days, every couple days with the U.S. Geological Survey, with the British Geological Survey, um, with different researchers around the country, with Nepal, all trying to figure out what was happening at the same time. Now, this is, I've never seen this happen. So it's really a tremendous effort, both in terms of NASA and other U.S. agencies, but also with the global community working together and sharing data. And, and that, I have to say, is oftentimes the biggest challenge. I was mentioning before, there is no global database for landslides. If there is, nobody shared it, nobody's told me about it. But I think more importantly is that people are just very, you know, they're, they're focusing on a very small area and they're, that's their research, right? It's not part of kind of distributing the data. And, and that's just how it works sometimes. But in this sense, um, everybody was sharing and it was, it was pretty tremendous. Another interesting thing that came out of this was you know, there's a lot of glaciers in Nepal, and they create lakes. So when the glaciers melt, they create lakes that are pretty, fl pretty fragile. So one of the things that was done is they actually surveyed 500 glacial lakes in all of Nepal and the surrounding areas. And they found that actually the earthquake did not destabilize, destabilize hardly anything. Um, so there were very few, if any, glacial lake outbursts, which is really, I mean, people are devote their careers to glacial lake outburst floods. And there weren't any. And so one of the huge research questions coming out of this is why? You know, why did we have such strong ground shaking? You know, there could be a bigger earthquake there. It could have been smaller. It could have been elsewhere. But why, scientifically, why did we have no outburst floods? I mean, it was great, but why? And so this earthquake and kind of mapping is spawning decades of research in this area. It was just so unique. And then one of the things that I contributed was understanding all of the different, not all, but many of the different components, as well as our landslide catalog that I showed you before, of where we might have susceptibility or the potential for landslides activity based on rainfall. And this was before the earthquake, this map, but it combines different information like road networks, slope, soils, other activity, to or other ground um, information to get a sense of the high to low landslide susceptibility. So this type of map is interesting for USCID or the Office of Foreign Disaster Assistance or for different re relief organizations that want to get a general picture of what might be happening, where are the areas that they should focus on more to provide response. So this data, um, not just the, infant, the susceptibility map, but the whole effort was, um, was used to brief the prime minister in Nepal and his cabinet to say these are the areas where we have concern in terms of landslide dams or other potential you know, hazardous features. And they also formed a geohazard task force where they brought 60 different scientists together, geologists to go and respond and, and look at these reports information. So this was also a case where the information, the analysis that we were doing actually got to the, to the people that needed to know. So that was also an interesting and exciting component of this work. That's another example. Okay, so 
I've gone through one, two, and three. So now I'm going to very briefly touch on modeling efforts in an interesting way. <laughs> and then what, you know, and then how others can get involved. Okay, so when I talk about landslide modeling, I'm talking about landslide susceptibility and rainfall triggers and in, in like this decision tree algorithm, blah, 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 right? So this is what my parents think about <laughs> when I talk about landslide modeling. So, so there's a disconnect, right? I mean, my parents are very educated people, but there's a disconnect. When you talk about a model, when you talk about an algorithm, everybody's going, oh, okay, I'm gonna check out for this part of the talk and I'm gonna think about what I'm gonna eat for lunch. So I get that. Um, and so the point that I'm gonna make, cause I'm not gonna talk about modeling, I'm just gonna show you the outputs, um, is that I've, we've learned and we've shown that NASA satellite data, Earth science data, can be used to both help, anticipate, and predict, and observe landslides. And so what we've done is couple or bring together a lot of different information, both on the surface, so we're looking at slope, um, which is provided by, uh, or vegetation, so that's the MODIS or instrument on board the Aqua and Terra satellite. We're looking at SLOPE, which is the SRTM mission that was flown. If anybody goes to the udvar -Hazy, who's been to the udvar -Hazy Museum? Um, Air Flight, it's my favorite museum, but I'm biased. If you, okay, the shuttle, everybody's seen the shuttle, right? Look above the shuttle to the, if you're looking at it to the, above it to the right, and it's the arm of this, this arm right here, this SRTM arm. Now, in terms of, <laughs> in terms of importance to science, the Shuttle Radar Topography Mission, SRTM, provided a global elevation map better than we've ever had before. And they actually just declassified the 30 meter resolution. Okay, I know that's kind of geek terminology and stuff, but it's really, really important because it tells us where we might have landslides because it tells you the slope, where you might have flooding, where you have cities, where you have coasts. So, I mean, things that you think we know, which we sort of do, but this was game changing in that. And so, if you go to Udvar Hazy again, take a look. It was pretty exciting. Okay, other examples of missions that were just launched, the SMAP mission, the Soil Moisture Active Passive mission, looks at soil moisture and freeze thaw states. And then the precipitation measurement mission, GPM, which is my other hat, um, provides us with global rainfall. And then of course, you know, you've seen this before, but you know, you have houses and roads and people, all of which we can use satellite data to figure out. But again, I, it's important to be able to understand that in the context of what we know on the ground. Um, and then burned areas and snow cover, um, we also have data sets for that too. So what we're working on right now, in fact, it's not even done yet, is, is looking at the globe for susceptibility. There have ma been maps that have been done before, but this is what our current version is as of yesterday. We're working on it. Um, but So this just shows a distribution of what you saw before with the landslides that we have and global susceptibility from low to high, from blue to red. And um, so the way that this factors in, so you have the kind of where. So in terms of when, we want to know how much it's raining, right? We already talked about rainfall being the most important trigger of landslides. Well, the Global Precipitation Measurement Mission, as, as Jennifer introduced, is an international constellation of satellites that together provide a global picture of rain and snow everywhere around the world every three hours. So it's sort of, which I found out yesterday, the lead violinist does not tune the orchestra, it's the oboe. So it's kind of like, you know, these people that are fact checking things, apparently they, they have an important job. So, so an oboe stands up apparently and tunes the orchestra and the orchestra plays one harmonious note. Well, the GPM core satellite, which is the red that you see coming around here, has the most advanced instruments to measure precipitation, rain and snow, from space. And so by being able to create a reference to, to basically standardize, to create a consistent um, measurement of rainfall, it gives us this global picture of rain that we've never had before, the best picture. And what's cool about that is that it's available within four hours of taking that picture. So it's kind of snapshots. But what you can see here, and this will loop, is this is taken from yesterday. This is the past seven days of rainfall, right? So you can look at the U.S., but what you can also see is Typhoon Soldelor. I probably butchered that. But um, that typhoon had a direct hit over Taiwan. And so if you see it, you can see the time frame here. It's going to loop. You see this starting to churn, and you can see it intensifying. Red means heavy precipitation. 
and you can see it hitting and then dissipating over China. So this data and all of these you know, graphics are available um, and updated every 30 minutes. Um, and so I could stare at this and explain all these features for a long time. If anybody asks a question, I'd be happy to talk more about it. Um, but this is a pretty tremendous um, data set that the public, it's open to the public. All NASA data is free and open to the public. Okay, so I said I was going to show you rather than talk about my algorithm. And, um, and so what we've developed is what's called an open landslide portal. And, um, and so what you see here, this is for Central America. We have a landslide model operating over Central America. And um, this is all of the landslides in our landslide inventory over that area. And so what you can do is you can overlay the latest rainfall. This is all from yesterday. You can see our rainfall accumulation. And then you can see our susceptibility map. And then you can actually see um, all of these areas right here. Let's see. All of these areas show um, potential landslide activity. So it's an indication of areas where we might have an increased a likelihood of landslides. Um, and so orange means kind of moderate and red means really likely. Um, and we haven't translated that into probabilities yet because this is still a work in progress. But what's really interesting is that not only do we have the landslide now cast, what we're calling it, but we have our one day rainfall accumulation. We've also brought in um, Bob Adler and Juan Wu at, at the University of Maryland. They have a global flood model. We have, um, we're pulling in data from University of Maryland for active fires and burned areas, as well as earthquakes. So this is becoming not just a landslide portal, but a, a hazard portal to provide information. OK, so to wrap up, what can you do? You know, how does this affect you? Well, if you remember at the beginning when I was talking about the landslide inventory and how tedious it is to go through reports and, uh, and put them in a database, um, I wasn't lying. It's extremely tedious. Dave, David Adler here can tell us how tedious it is, but it's really, really important. And so we've built um, this portal where you can actually zoom in. I'll give you the URL. I don't know if I include it, actually, but I will. Um, you can zoom in and you can look at information on individual landslides. And you can also edit landslides and add your own landslides um, through this crowdsourcing effort. So we're kind of leveraging citizen science and crowdsourcing. At least we're just starting to. I'm, I'm, I'm talking to you, and then I'm actually going over to FEMA to talk to them about, about how we can kind of leverage this citizen science and crowdsourcing activity. Um, so you can actually zoom in, and you can create in, you know, a landslide and fill in all the different fields that you want or none and, and actually add a landslide to the system. So if you happen to see that in your hometown, um, probably not here because we don't get a whole lot of landslides here, but maybe back in Colorado or others, um, if you heard about a landslide, you can actually go into the system and add it yourself. And we're working to make the system easier to use. To, we're building an, we're going to build an app. So this is, and then we're going to have different agencies on board. So the US Geological Survey, FEMA, this is all very new and hasn't been finalized yet, but I'm still going to talk about it. Um, it's, it's just a new way to think of, of how we can get hazard or science data in a new way, right? Leveraging all of the expertise of our global community. OK, I promise you this. All time favorite landslide video. <laughs> just to recap. OK, so this is. Um, this is a landslide that happened in Italy. Um, I don't believe anyone was hurt or injured or killed or anything, so that's why I like it. Um, but you can see a whole lot from this, okay? So you can see how things are starting to move pretty slowly here. And then there's more moisture, more water that gets into the material, and then it starts to flow more quickly. Um, you can see how close they are to towns. And, you know, landslides happen all the time in Italy. Um, you can also get a sense of the, the type of debris. I mean, you see these huge trees just being transported all the way down the hill. Um, if anyone speaks Italian, you can say, yeah, get out of the way. And then you have, you know, the requisite people running for their lives, but, you know, it was okay. Um, so the point is, is that, you know, they often are not this big. They can take you know, take up the space of the whole of this room or even smaller, but they, um, but they can be a pretty tremendous on the landscape. Um, so what's the problem? Probably should have started with this, but 
we don't have any operational monitoring systems like we do for earthquakes. You know, when the Nepal earthquake happened, they knew right away. Why? Because there's seismic, seismographs all over the world in this network and more that can give you a sense of what's happening. Um, tsunamis, they've developed a new system. Hurricanes, we have, we have satellites. So that's a problem. So as this, clearly there's more to do, but we know that remote sensing can start to answer some of these questions. And um, you know, now my work is really involved with improving the models at the regional scale to give us what's called situational awareness, what's happening with landslides. And then why slopes, some slopes fail, but not others. You know, you could have, there were some valleys in Nepal that there were no landslides. And then there was another valley over with tons. Okay, so what, so that kind of leads to this decade of research question. Why was, why did that happen? You know, what was the, the seismic signals and the way that the earth was destabilized to cause that? And then, you know, I think in the entire litany, we have so much data. We have so much data, so much data from satellites, but the biggest impediment remains the landslide cataloging. And you can't do that at a global scale from satellites yet. They're too small. There's, you know, there's, we're working on it though. I was gonna present that, but I didn't wanna go over time. So that's where we're, we're working towards, you know, enabling citizens to help us with this problem. So um, if you're interested, happy to give you my card and, and you know, stay tuned. Hopefully we'll make a big campaign out of it. But, um, but this is kind of an area of, of um, emerging research. We haven't quite got there yet, but I think we're, we have all the prototypes. So again, that's, that's about it. And I want to thank you guys for coming and happy to entertain questions. Ever been a great uh, landslide that did good, that you know, created a fertile plain in a uh, trash heap or, you know, that, that uh, you know, brought down good soil that's a good question. There have been landslides in trash heaps. <laughs> um, I mean, I think that the fundamental thing is, is a natural hazard is just the fact that, you know, it, it's a hazard, but it becomes a disaster when people are involved. So, um, you know, the, I don't know specifically, you know, of cases where the slope the soil is better in one location and it's transported to another, but it changes ecosystems. You know, if it, if it dams a river, then it gives the ability of other, you know, fish and other to change their habitat. So it's, it's a natural process. And when humans get involved, it's a problem. Um, but, but yeah, I mean, I think a lot of landslides happen in those fertile areas and that affect people. For example, people building on volcanoes, great soil, very, you know, the soil is not very good, you know, layers of ash and layers of, of really rich organic soil all together. So when there's a landslide, it kind of just all goes. So, yeah, it's, it's a complicated problem, but it's an interesting question. Yeah. Have you ever, oh, sorry, um, I forgot to repeat. Um, Notice that the landslide happened where new roads were mm -hmm. built. Yes. And then trees were cut down, you know, then uh, the soil got... Uh, yes. Less solid, you know, so, and uh, then it rains and then it just... Absolutely. So, you know, th so the question is, you know, do we observe more landslides in areas where you have roads or deforestation? And the answer is absolutely yes. You know, if you think about it, if you have tree roots holding some, something in place, and then you chop down the trees, and then you, you know, if you, if you drive along a mountain road, it's not like, oh, it's a gradual decline, and then, you know, here's your road. I mean, if you're at the valley floor, it is. But if you're in the middle of it, it's probably really steep, and it's been over-steepened because they had to cut, make a road cut. And so by over-steepening it, if you don't, you know, I'm not an engineer, but if you don't take into account the engineering that's needed, then you can have big problems. And so we have observed a lot of our landslides along roads. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, more and more scientists use the crowdsourcing. Mm -hmm. uh, how do you manage the quality control? So like the false information Great question. So how do you manage quality control with crowdsourcing? <laughs> we don't yet. <laughs> That's why this is an emerging project. You know, um, I'm hoping if I were to give this talk in six months, my goal for six months from now, since this is being recorded, is, um, is to have some quality control measures in place for people to be able to validate other people's 
reports, um, as well as um, kind of have more information out there about making sure what you report, you know, the way to report is accurate. So if somebody reported a landslide and they said, I think it happened at, you know, this point in the highway, and then somebody reported another landslide that ends up being the same landslide, you know, a kilometer down, down the road, how do you reconcile the fact that those are the same event? So there's a lot that still needs to be done. And I am very much open to people who are experts in, or experts in crowdsourcing to help with that problem, because that is not a science problem. It's a social science problem, so, and technology. Mm -hmm. I was wondering, do all landslides get included in this database, or there's like a, there like a s small limit? Um, and also, are you only looking for recent landslides, or also, like, I've looked at, like, LIDAR to identify past landslides? Mm-hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, so um, the question is about what types of landslides are included in the database. Um, when we started in 2007, we were only doing rainfall-triggered landslides. And that was because we wanted to evaluate the modeling that we were doing, which was rainfall-triggered landslide modeling. Um, we also did not include, so we didn't include earthquake-triggered or human-induced, which is also a big part. You know, people are mining or people dig a hole and then the whole the material falls on them and that's considered a landslide. We didn't include those. Um, but uh, w I think there's the opportunity to kind of branch into that realm. In terms of LIDAR, I mean, LIDAR and other satellite um, assets allow you to look at landslides in a different way. The one thing that we require, though we might have to loosen that up, is knowing when it happened. So it's, it's a lot easier to tell you know, where landslides happen, because you can look at a satellite image and say, oh, that looks like a landslide scar. But knowing when it happened is really important for being able to model. And with LIDAR, unless you have like very, you know, close together passes, or you do dating, which is, you know, a whole nother issue um, of the sediments, it's really hard to know when. And so that's why we haven't included them until now. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so you're doing a lot of work analyzing satellite records, rainfall records, what work is being done to analyze the geomorphology of the underlying factors below the surface? Mm -hmm. You know, in general? So so the question is about the geomorphology. So analyzing the geology and, and the surface materials, the lithology. Um, you know, it's there's a lot of different data sets that are available, you know, global s soil data sets, global geology. But that actually is, is a big um, challenge because, you know, imagine trying to get soil surveys for everywhere in the world. Like, you know, I mean, we don't even know, it, it, you have to do it by, it, you know, by actual soil sample. And so there's a lot of uncertainty or unknown about the underlying um, conditions. And that I think is another big uncertainty. So slope, I feel like, you know, depending on what scale you're at, you're at we have a pretty good handle on. Rainfall now with the help of satellite data, we're doing better, not great, not, you know, perfect, but better. But geology, because you can't see it from space in the sense of like you can draw a map of what the underlying geology is, it's, it's still a big issue. But I mean, there's, you know, people that have devoted their entire lives to doing this. So I respect their work and just use it. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm hmm. Right. Um, so, uh, you know, uh, how, how do you, when you're looking at, I mean, if you're looking just at rainfall numbers, like, how do you, how do you make that, how do you factor that into your determination? Um, so, so that's a great question. So how do you bring together, just basically, from what I understand is, how do you bring together different elements of what could contribute to susceptibility into the model? Well, well I mean, mm -hmm. areas are known susceptibility, so how do you Yes. So, so, Areas that are known to be susceptible, we kind of we often just use our known landslides that have happened there to validate how well we can model the process. So, so for example, like the Pacific Northwest has pretty complex topography. It tends to be pretty wet, though not for the past six years in California, but that's another issue. Um, and uh, and then there's other elements that we know, um, you know, burned areas, for example, or um, different types of soils that together when you combine them in a model can tell you about what you think the susceptibility could be but that's but then you need to evaluate that and so you need 
information on the landslide, so the known areas of susceptibility, to, um, to improve your model. So basically you're able to, to calibrate it so that you know better. But what's interesting is that the, if I'm not mistaken, which I don't think I am, the, the susceptibility, the, if you want a US-wide susceptibility map, it hasn't been updated in about 20 years. So that is a problem. <laughs> And that's largely because, you know, they built a map, but there isn't kind of a motivation for knowing what it is at the national scale. Now, local, a lot more is known, absolutely. You know, regionally, or um, looking at, you know, a county or a city or even a slope, there's a lot known in different areas that are susceptible. But to get that bigger perspective, which is kind of the area that I'm in, um, there's still a lot unknown to be consistent. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um, is there information about, um, like you may have areas where there are, that are high risk of uh, landslides but maybe low population density, or right. so you, if there's a way of sort of incorporating the model mm -hmm. where there's high risk but also maybe high risk of human impact or where you know, first responders can first go. Right, right. So, yeah, so I mean, to kind of break down the terminology, so hazard is kind of the physical hazard of the you know, landslide itself, um, or the, you know, the hazard. Exposure means, you know, what is in harm's way? What population or what assets, what structures? And then risk is, okay, now let's, tran or vulnerability is how vulnerable are those people or assets to the hazard? And then risk is kind of combining it all together. So what I do is the hazard right now, but I do include roads because we learned that roads are now a, a factor that ties into increasing susceptibility. But we don't include population. Um, and so what we can do and what we have done a bit is to say, OK, now that we know what the hazard is of an area, let's see where it intersects people. Let's see where it intersects assets. And, and then you can do a new metric to say, here's the areas that are, you know, have a potential for landslide activity in near real time. But here are the, the areas that actually affect people. And so we're still working on that first part. But the second part is absolutely kind of the next step in the research. Mm -hmm. And there was a village that was just a, just short bit. Oh, sure, above it. Above it. Yes. Um, yeah, that one. Yeah. Um, so right there. Does is that village now uh, much more vulnerable to a landslide based on the steepening of the slope right below it? Yes. Yeah. So sorry. The question is, is the the landslide that or the landslide that occurred below the village make the village at more? risk to future landsliding. Well, exactly. So you have this steepening. So if you think about it, you know, you have your steepening and then it gets more steep. So it's called like a progressive landsliding. So then, you know, what this is called the crown, there we go, the crown of the landslide, then it starts to fail and the material above it starts to fail. And so you progressively get these failures up slope sometimes. So that's a, that's a big concern. So Not necessarily. Uh, that, you know, I think it, it depends on so much. You know, what's the underlying material? What, um, you know, what is going to cause um, the slope to fail in the first place? How much rain is coming in? Are the villagers not doing a good job? Um, a lot of the times when you have a village that's built right in the middle of a slope, um, irrigating all their wastewater, getting it out of the way is a big problem. So it just pools in the subsurface all of this wastewater of different kinds and it causes a failure because you have that, you know, lubrication of the bottom layer. So, um, so there's a whole host of things that could happen, or the village could be fine for like a hundred more years. That's what we're trying. I mean, that's why we're trying to figure out why some slopes fail and not others. I mean, that whole area is most likely susceptible. So why that place? It's, um, there's very detailed models, but still they're not good enough to be able to answer that question all the time. What um, ways would there be to minimize the damage caused by mm -hmm. landslides in highly susceptible areas? Because mm -hmm. if, if you can predict that it's going to happen there, right. what can, can be done in order to limit damage? 
Right. So what can be done to limit damage in a landslide? Well, I think, you know, there are some places like California where they know Malibu, <laughs> where there's a whole lot of issues, right? So you see when you drive along the road, often you can see like a mesh on the side of the slopes or you see it sprayed with this weird color. You know, so all of these engineering um, measures to to um, I had a, I have a slide on it somewhere in some presentation to like you can stick poles into the slope to kind of keep everything on. Um, there's all these different engineering measures you can you can take. Um, the easiest easiest is to just have people not build in susceptible areas. <laughs> but that's from the scientist science side. From the social science side, the easiest I don't know. It, it's a complex problem. But yeah, it's um, because people tend to build in more marginal areas. The poor people tend to build in more marginal areas that, you know, other people don't want to build, and they tend to be often in, like, you know, Rio, for example. You have all these favelas in the middle of these big developments, but those favelas, I mean, they're built like this. And Haiti, if you look on Google Earth, if you fly around Haiti and after the earthquake, you'll see, you know, all of these shanty towns that are just built on slopes like this. And it's just, um, I don't know, it's really sad. Yeah. Have you studied, uh, you know, these rice terraces? Yes, the rice terraces. Mm -hmm. uh, are they dangerous for life? I don't think so. Uh, you know, it's an excellent question. Are rice terraces where you have all the terraced agriculture? Um, I um, I don't know. But the idea that they've, I mean, this is totally speculative because this is not my area of, yeah. Because, uh, yeah. All Exactly, yeah. You Exactly. I have never heard of that going down, so maybe that's the, the way to prevent landslides. You know, I, and, and it's an excellent point, that, that terracing approach. I mean, it's been perfected over centuries, and so, you know, the people who've been perfecting it over centuries probably know more about it than, you know, than a lot of the people that are doing the engineering of the slopes that have, you know, been cut by roads. So, uh, you know, unfortunately, I don't have an answer for you, but I think that your hypothesis is correct. <laughs> okay, so it's 12, a little past 1230. I want to thank everybody for coming. And here's the URL oh, okay. for the thing. So. <laughs> thank you so much. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.